Dr. Elliot Johnson came to Dallas Seminary to teach on our faculty in 1972. Also became a pastor in a Dallas area church at that, that same year. Uh, he's published in Bibsack and other uh, places a number of times, written or contributed on several books, especially on issues related to hermeneutics. Uh, while on the mission field in the Philippines, he helped found the Asian Theological Seminary. He's taught extensively overseas, including not only the Philippines, but Poland and the former Czechoslovakia, Romania, Russia, and India. Uh, he and his wife, Inga, have six children and 18 grandchildren. Uh, what I have also appreciated about Dr. Johnson, he is a consummate churchman. I've uh, been on the staff at Pantego Bible Church, been a teaching uh, pastor there uh, in leadership, helping teach teachers uh, all of these years. Uh, he has kept a foot in the church and a foot on the seminary, and we deeply appreciate that. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Elliot Johnson to our platform this morning? Actually, I do feel a bit like Michael Young from the Texas Rangers. <laughs> There's only one thing missing, however. I've asked Chaplain Bill to renegotiate my contract. <laughs> I'm not sure he's a uh, suitable. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate these young ladies who have come to hear Dr. Hannah. <laughs> What I would like to do this, this morning is take you on a journey. It's a journey that actually began when I was a student, much like many of you. I was in the course on Bible study methods, and there the Lord began teaching me a lesson which I'd like to share with you. It came from a passage that we were studying there. Now, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 28. It's a section which has a important context in order to appreciate what the Lord is doing here. It's only a few hours, perhaps, maybe days after our Lord's triumphal entry. He staged that entry in order to make his claim very clear based on Old Testament prophecy, that he, in fact, was the Messiah. The Jewish leaders didn't readily accept this, and so in the temple following the triumphal entry, he, our Lord, stood and answered the questions from a wide range of perspectives within Judaism. These questions had been answered well, and so at the very end, a scribe, the one that is introduced in verse 28, one of the scribes approached when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well. He asked him, what command is the most important of all? This passage struck me as a young student our Lord was answering a scribe and his handling of the scripture. And that's where I was, at least in a beginning stage. I was interested in the question he raised. We're not sure exactly why this question was raised, whether this was a matter of debate within Judaism, having 613 laws, which one was prominent, that might have been his motivation. It may have been that he was expecting Jesus to answer something from Scripture related to the triumphal entry. But when our Lord did answer, he reached back into the Scripture and chose what was central to Judaism and what was central to Moses and quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let me begin reading at verse 29. This is the most important, Jesus answered. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other command greater than these. As a young student, seeing myself in this scribe, I took three things that really impressed me from this passage. The first was the very choice that our Lord had made. Loving God ought to be my focus as a student. That was the perspective I first took away. However, I found that as I continued as a student, it wasn't quite as easy as I thought it would be. Setting the Lord as my focus in study was one thing. Living that out was another. In our day, there were students that were divided into two classes. We both in each of the class took the same exams. And we had a light, we had a, uh, where we got our papers back down in the basement of the library. And I remember on days when papers would come back, we used blue books in those days. You know, you'd, you'd open your box and then you'd take out your blue book and sort of hesitantly you'd look at the grade. And if it was good, you'd open it a little longer. <laughs> you know, your insecurities can be overcome if you've done well academically. And you really recognize that the one you're really loving is not God, but yourself. And that's why it's taken me so long to learn the lesson. I'm still in the process. I remember one of the students that was in my class. He was a good student. His wife and my wife were birth, both nurses at Baylor Hospital. And so we got quite well acquainted. When he got to his senior year, he said, you know, I've got an objective. I want the best grades in this class for the four years of study. I'm interested in getting into the doctoral program, and therefore, I need the best grades. Well, as it turned out, that objective that he set for himself wasn't fully realized. He did get into doctoral school, and we both graduated at the same time. Upon graduation, as Dr. Bailey said, we and my wife and I, and at that time two children, went to the Philippines to establish a school, and he and his wife and family went to the West Coast for ministry. We actually lost track of each other. It was some years later that I heard the following report. He had left the ministry and left his wife. Now, I'm not in the place to judge. I'm not in the place to decide whether what he was doing was correct or not. But it did challenge me to ask the question, in taking your eyes off of the Lord, as the center of your focus, could that have accounted for what happened in his life? Well, the first thing that impressed me with what this passage was saying is the passage that our Lord chose. The second thing that impressed me was the emphasis that he made from that passage. Now, one of the things I had learned in Bible study methods was to compare what was in the text in Mark with what was in the text in Deuteronomy. Interestingly, it was different. In Deuteronomy, it was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Jesus had added love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now, in the study of Hebrew, Wolf would suggest in his Anthropology of the Old Testament that the reference to the heart is actually a reference to a reasonable person. So it includes the mind as well as the spirit. 
What our Lord was doing was not really changing the meaning. He was merely fleshing out one aspect of the meaning, the mind. And I asked myself the question, why? I think one of the reasons why is that what we think about God influences who we love. Dallas Willard suggests that knowledge rather than volition and affection are the grounds for loving God. I think that's one aspect of it. But I think there's another aspect of it, and that is that Israel's knowledge of God in that generation was flawed. One of the most intense debates that our Lord had in his generation is recorded in John chapter 8. They were accusing Jesus of casting out demons by Satan, and they were claiming that the God of the Old Testament was their God. John chapter 8, verse 42, Jesus said to them, if, you're, if God were your father, you would love me. What they saw in God is the one whom they possessed. He was their God, rather than the God who possessed them. He was the God they claimed and they defined, rather than being the one that he called them to be his children. And had they been that, they would have recognized a family similarity between God and the Son. Actually, the author of John, the John the Apostle, drew out this similarity much more clearly. When he identified our Lord as the Word, I think that there are two aspects in that interpretation. One aspect is what is recorded in John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He so identified our Lord because he was the one within the Trinity or the multiplicity of the headship of God that spoke. At least there were two, as John 1.1 1, 1 indicates. But I think there was more than that. I think he also recognized our Lord as the living expression of everything that had been written in the Old Testament. As he reflected on what the Old Testament had promised, he saw that being lived out in our Lord. As he reflected on what the Old Testament commanded, he saw that in our Lord's obedience. He was the Word who became flesh. But not only in his ministry did he see that familial comp com you know, comparison like father, like son, but in his person as well. For having observed our Lord for the three years, he drew this conclusion, we beheld the Lord's glory. And this is the passage that Bill referred to, has referred to. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. That combination in human terms produced conflict. To be gracious, how can you be truthful? To be truthful, you're not going to be exactly gracious. But in our Lord, as in God, the two fit perfectly together. And what Jesus is calling for is that we love with our mind, that the God that we know is the God that we love. The God that we think about is the God that we love. That was the second thing. But the, there was a third thing that impressed me. 
And the third thing that impressed me was that way in which he described it. I followed the pattern, but he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. Now, what does it mean to be a lover with all your mind? That's an unusual idiom. We talk about wholehearted activity, and what we mean by that is it's undivided. We talk about single-minded attention, and what we mean by that is focused attention. So perhaps what we mean when we say whole-minded or all your mind, we mean undivided attention directed toward the Lord's word and toward the Lord. I think this idiom, however, finds the clearest explanation in the words that Luke used to describe the Bereans when Paul came to minister to them. They were open-minded, and they were contrasted with the Thessalonians. Now, we know what that open-mindedness involved because we know what Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians was. It was a very sim simple syllogism. It began with Scripture. The Scriptures say, now these are, this is the Hebrew text, the Scriptures say that Messiah must die and be resurrected. That's what the Scripture said. We are testimony, we have a testimony or we are witnesses to the fact of Jesus of Nazareth who died and was resurrected. Conclusion, therefore, Jesus is Messiah. Only some in Thessalonica responded. But in Berea, they responded with an open-mindedness in this sense, that they were open to the witness that Paul brought concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And they were eager, secondly, to the study of Scripture to see if, in fact, Scripture did teach that Messiah would die and be resurrected. And you know what Luke records? Many believed. They were open-minded lovers of God, willing to examine the message and willing to examine the scriptures. Now, it seems to me that that puts your finger on exactly what Jesus was addressing to this scribe. For the scribe, is going to respond in verse 32 and answer Jesus. If you have your Bibles again, verse 32. Then the scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You have correctly said. So the scribe is agreeing with what Jesus said. Now there are three elements in his answer which are interesting. He begins with Deuteronomy 6. He is one, God is one. He puts, the scribe, however, puts more emphasis on his being only, the only God. There is no one else except him. The uniqueness, the oneness that Judaism emphasized. Then he quotes our Lord's words, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But he concludes with the final clause, is, this commandment is far more important than burnt offerings and sacrifices. That would suggest that that was the debate in Judaism. Were sacrifices more important than loving God? Our Lord has said loving him is the most important. It ought to be the focus in our lives as students, as it ought to be the focus in the steward's life. But notice what he answers. It's found in verse um, 
beginning in verse 33. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding. See the change? Our Lord had said, love with all your mind. The scribe said, love with all your understanding. Now, some texts don't make a large distinction here, even though they are distinct terms in the text, distinct Greek terms. I think the context would suggest that there is a distinction that should be made. But what is the distinction between loving God with all your mind and loving God with all your understanding? Now, I think we would accept that as we read scriptures or read a text, we are to understand what the author is saying. But I think Jesus is referring to a special case when what the author is saying is beyond our understanding. What do we do with texts like that? What do we do with texts that we just can't understand? It's easy to accept what makes sense and discard what doesn't. To emphasize those things that we can understand and give little, pay little attention to those things which we can't. Well, it seems to me that that's the final issue that our Lord addresses. Passages that can be understood and passages that can't. For he begins in verse uh, 35. So Jesus asked this question as he taught in the temple complex. How can the scribes say that Messiah is the son of David? David himself says by the Holy Spirit, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. What our Lord did was refer to two passages in this Old Testament. One was the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7. It promised that Messiah would be David's son. Israel understood that. Remember when the Magi came to Jerusalem, they asked Herod, where Messiah would be born. He asked the Jewish leaders, and they knew from Micah 5 too, he would be born in the city of David. There wasn't any discussion on that question. But there was a discussion on, was he also God? And that's the passage, the second passage that Jesus, that Jesus refers to. That's Psalm 110.1. It's the passage that he quotes. However, Jesus is the one who interprets it for us. So let's just listen to his interpretation. Number one, he acknowledges that Psalm 110 is David's composition. Now that's what the superscription says, but as you know, the superscription is not inspired. It was a later historical edition, but our Lord confirms that historical statement. David penned this psalm. He wrote it. Secondly, Jesus interprets the psalm. If you read it in the passage that is quoted from Psalm 110, all of the words except two describe what God the Father or Yahweh, said to David's son, the Lord declared to my Lord. The only words that David actually composes are the two, my Lord. My is a term of relationship. It's the same kind of construct had David said that he is my son. Both are correct. But Lord is a term of status. And David is accepting the status 
that Yahweh declared relative to his anointed one. For he said, Yahweh said, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your foot. That declaration identified the status of David's descendant as Lord. And that posed the dilemma. How can Jesus, how can Messiah, not Jesus, but how can Messiah be both Son and Lord? How can Messiah be both human and divine? See, as a young student, I learned if I was going to love God, I was going to have to study the, pers- the scriptures in that perspective. Not according to what I understood or what satisfied me, but according to what God had included in the scriptures. What I would call you for, you survivors of the storm, <laughs> I would call you to the same challenge that I try to follow. As I treat the scripture, am I treating it as a lover of God and listening in an undivided attention to all that he says, whether I understand it or whether I don't? And what the scripture said then becomes the foundation for our lives. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that our Lord called us to be lovers of yours, to love you, and to focus our attention as students of the Scripture on loving you. Lord, that includes our minds, and it includes how we think about the Scriptures. And Lord, we pray that we may be willing to accept what you have said, even though it may not make sense to us, even as our Lord instructed his generation to love the Lord your God with all your mind. Lord, help us to be faithful students. As faculty, help us to continue to be students of your word carefully, with an open mind, listening to what you have said. And as students, I pray that you would guide them to commit, be committed to loving you as they work with the scriptures. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.